Good morning. My name is Todd Kilbaugh. I am a uh, anesthesiologist and pediatric intensivist here at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. I'm also the director of the Resuscitation Science Center, as well as the director of the Anesthesia and Critical Care Mitochondrial Unit. The topic of my uh, session today was ICU and anesthesia with mitochondria. And I thought I'd take a bit of a curve um, and instead of talking about kids with mitochondrial disease that are in the intensive care unit or, in, uh, or receiving anesthesia, which I think probably most of you have a fairly um, good handle on, I really wanted to talk about what I believe is you know, sort of a new frontier, and that's the evolution of patients beyond just kids with mitochondrial um, disease. To really talk about that, I think that most patients with critical illness, those that have had trauma or ischemia, um, those who have had sepsis or exposed to other chemical to toxins, et cetera, really have mitochondrial disease as well, um, that we all have mitochondrial variants that lead to whether we live or survive, and that these uh, critical illnesses um, actually affect both the mitochondrial function and mitochondrial adaptation. Um, that I think is one of the fulcrums to whether a patient um, in our intensive care units live or die. Um, these are my disclosures and my funding lines. And so I think what we are we know in intensive care medicine and pediatrics right now is that we continue to have patients that survive. Patients that have cancer, patients that have had traumatic injuries, patients that we put on extracorporeal devices, patients with uh, sick lungs on ventilators for long periods of time, patients that develop sepsis, um, the survival rates continue to improve um, in the United States. The problem is that the neurologic sequelae and neurodevastation of these patients that are surviving continues to increase. So the real future of what I believe is intensive care me medicine is understanding how we can lead to better neurologic outcomes. And so I think the major question that we're left with, is it enough to be alive? Is it enough for a child to come into our intensive care unit for us to levy millions of dollars incredible amounts of resources to save these children's lives, to then send them back into the world very different from whence they came. And so what interested me when I first started thinking about what I wanted to do with my scientific endeavors many years ago was how do we preserve life and how do we create life? And this is uh, a slide that uh, I have stolen from Dr. Wallace, and I'm sure you're gonna see lots of slides stolen from uh, Dr. Wallace because he's uh, the man. And, but I think what became very interesting to me over time is that one thing that we weren't talking about in intensive care medicine or in critical illness at all about 15, 20 years ago was this idea of energy or vital force. Um, we sort of forgot about these sub things and we have forgotten really about mitochondria as an important tool, both to understand how organs fail, but also how to preserve organs to, in the terms of the brain, how we look at uh, neuroprotection, how we look at neuroregeneration, um, how we limit neuro uh, dysfunction. Uh, those type of things, I think, um, for me, are really the frontier of critical care medicine. And so one of the things that I think we've had a problem with is how do we then develop a pathway of looking at all of these things by using things like in vitro analyses, using um, small invertebrate and vertebrate models, using genetic uh, models in mice, um, and then how do we then recapitulate what we do in an intensive care unit? And one of the things that we've sort of built is uh, built onto our platform is using large animals. Uh, we use mostly um, porcine models, but we do have other large animal models. But the ability to use large animal models really allows us to create a intensive care environment with the ability to do invasive molecular studies, look at uh, uh, 
biomedical devices. It also allows us to build um, all kinds of different platforms for critical illness. And so what we're left with is these large animal models that uh, recapitulate traumatic brain injury, cardiac arrest, cardiopulmonary bypass, stroke, um, cardiopulmonary bypass, such as uh, extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, ECMO, hydrocephalus, chemical threats, which I'll talk about, sepsis, ARDS. And I think the real future in these large animal models is also to create genetic models that will look very similar to um, the mouse models that um, have become critical to understanding mitochondrial disease and developing mitochondrial therapeutics. So I'm just going to give you a little bit of an overview of our lab and some of the critical illnesses that we look at and how we take this bent at looking at mitochondrial dysfunction uh, and trying to understand these things. The first thing uh, we have a uh, fairly large grant with is with the National Counteract Initiative. About four or five years ago, um, myself and a bunch of my colleagues uh, were sitting around and we were talking about sort of the devastation that was going on in Syria and chemical weapons. Um, and we started thinking about rotenone and some of the other known mitochondrial toxins. And we started wondering how do some of these common drugs affect mitochondria? Um, and how do these common toxins affect mitochondria? And can we uh, look at that and then develop therapeutics around those things? And we are also very interested in how these affect children uh, because children have a uh, smaller body surface area. So when they're, these uh, chemical toxins are absorbed in the air and on their skin, um, they tend to be the ones that are the ones dying. Um, older adults, unless they are in a very small area, um, they uh, tend to survive and have long-term sequelae, but children tend to die and also have long-term sequelae. So we really became interested in how um, these different uh, chemical weapons, such as organofluorines, organophosphates, things like sarin gas, um, ricin, um, things that are used as chemical weapons, how they affect mitochondrial function. Um, so it sort of fit into our whole theme of that there are genetic aspects of mitochondria, there's trauma, there's drugs, there's chemicals, there's all kinds of things that are affecting these things. Um, and that ultimately this is sort of the switch between whether uh, you are going to live or die um, after you had a critical illness or to these chemical weapons. So over the last couple of years, we've built um, a fairly extensive platform to study different types of toxins, starting with in vitro models of brain, heart, and other organ cells, all the way up through zebrafish, mice, and rats, um, and then also in our large animal model. So we can really start to develop therapeutic platforms where we can look at the individual um, effects of these different toxins and then develop therapeutics um, that work or bypass or counteract these toxins and how they affect mitochondria. So some of the first initial experiments that we've looked at is in zebrafish. Um, so, and with a sulpermeal succinate drug that uh, is obviously is a pro drug that allows the deposition of succinate that feeds complex two. Many of these organofluorines, uh, like uh, sodium fluoroacetate, affect complex one activity. And you can kind of see across the bottom on your, your left is uh, complex one activity and the dark bar is sodium fluoroacetate after um, it's been given to these zebrafish. Um, and we sort of harvest and, and look, at the, um, look at mitochondrial function in the seahorse. We've also looked at heart rate and also the touch response. So the sort of how these uh, animals uh, uh, neuronal activity works. And we can see that sodium fluoroacetate affects both their heart and their brain. And we can bypass and improve that by adding uh, these pro uh, succinate drugs. We can have done this with other um, chemical weapons um, that are uh, such as a drug called NSNM, which is a surrogate for uh, sarin gas and other um, uh, chemical weapons that we can also in those kind of uh, rescue their mitochondrial respiration. In addition, we've looked at carbon monoxide poisoning, uh, obviously, um, affects mitochondria, as we've known for, for many, many years, um, but we've tried to use uh, rodent models to then develop, um, and now we have uh, porcine models to look at how carbon monoxide poisoning affects mitochondria and develop treatments for that. 
traumatic brain injury is a pretty interesting uh, field. And really what I first got interested in mitochondria about 15 years ago, um, when I first started, nobody was looking at uh, how mitochondria is really affected after traumatic brain injury. And that has really just exploded over the last 15 years. And one thing that we've noticed um, in our large animals is that when we take an animal, we have a animal exposed to a very mild rotational injury. The animal's head sort of moves in a 120 degree arc. Um, and during that period of time, um, it has sort of diffuse axonal injury. And these animals, I would say, would be very similar to a kid on a playground that falls um, and has concussion-like symptoms, uh, probably doesn't have loss of consciousness, but um, may have headaches, may have problems in school, those sort of things. And what you can see in this graph on the left is really the time course of complex one activity post um, traumatic brain injury. And what we see um, compared to sham animals that complex one, even in these mild injuries, continues to be a problem weeks out after um, traumatic brain injury. This graph shows up to seven days, but we've looked at this in the patients or in our animals that have had significant neurologic dysfunction, um, white matter injury on MRI, problems with uh, learning, those sort of things, their complex one dysfunction continues. We also think that um, this is a uh, one of the major contributors to chronic traumatic uh, encephalopathy. Um, we do see tau aggregation and phosphorylated tau aggregation in these animals. And so there is a major piece of how mitochondria are affected during traumatic brain injury. Additionally, um, age um, and, it, in turn, and gender are incredibly um, uh, important in how their mitochondrial uh, function looks uh, after a traumatic brain injury. Um, even sort of standards of care. So um, even if you're not an intensive care medicine doctor, you probably know that if you've had a severe traumatic brain injury, that one of the things that or the, really the only thing that we do is besides in, in trying to control intracranial hypertension is try to increase uh, a patient's sort of blood flow. Um, and that's known by uh, as sort of perfusion pressure and sort of perfusion pressure as an equation is mean arterial pressure minus ICP. So we'll often raise patient's blood pressure to maintain so your perfusion pressure is greater than in kids, probably ages one to two, about a CPP of 40, and in children uh, greater uh, than sort of two years of age to a CPP of 70. But even by using optimal intensive care in 2020, you still can't completely reverse um, their uh, mitochondrial injury after a severe traumatic brain injury. Um, this slide, um, what I wanted to show is that the sort of other evolution of outside of just looking at the electron transport chain for us has been to start looking at how mitochondrial networking uh, is affected after um, traumatic brain injury. There are, um, as most of you know, fusion and fission um, and alterations in mitochondrial dynamics are an incredibly important role and can be manipulated after um, injuries. Another piece in Looking at mitochondria after injury is one problem that we have is how do you actually measure mitochondrial injury after you've had a traumatic brain injury? How do you measure anything really after a traumatic brain injury? There are very few diagnostics that are, allow us to do things like develop adaptive trials for mitochondrial therapeutics, um, really try to prove in humans that mitochondrial uh, dysfunction is a problem afterwards. So we have a grant with the Department of Defense to use cell-free DNA and methylation patterns of cell-free DNA, as well as cell-free mitochondrial DNA to actually map that time course and use um, these biosignatures as peripheral biomarkers of injury. A next important piece uh, is ischemia reperfusion injury. Um, we particularly look at stroke and cardiac arrest, and here I'll talk about cardiac arrest. You know, cardiac arrest is a, um, a devastating uh, disease process that is obviously a culmination of a lot of different etiologies, but many patients that suffer a cardiac arrest, um, whether that's in hospital or out of hospital, um, have initial survival. And if you look at pediatrics, most of these children will actually survive their cardiac arrest. Um, we have rapid response teams in hospitals now. We train to do good CPR. And so most of these kids will survive their initial cardiac arrest. 
But the problem is after they have return of spontaneous circulation, by the time they get to hospital discharge, most of these patients uh, um, have died. Um, 70 to 80% of these patients have died. The problem with uh, even improving their outcomes over the last few years by, um, again, improving the way that we deliver care is that as we've raised rates of survival to hospital discharge, our neurologic outcomes have, have stayed flat. And so, again, as mitochondrial zealots, we've started to use different animal models to start to really understand what happens again um, after cardiac arrest. Complex one um, and complex one physiology, again, much like tra traumatic injury, um, plays a incredibly important role. And we've started to map that after cardiac arrest and ischemia and perfusion, both in the brain and in the heart. Um, this has been published by us several times, but one thing I wanted to point out is that these biosignatures of mitochondria are not just an epiphenomenon. What we do see is that when we um, correlate mitochondrial function or oxidative phosphorization and changes um, after cardiac arrest, those are correlative with uh, actual outcome scores in our animals. So animals that have had, um, that continue to have Poor oxidative phosphorization um, have continued complex one dysfunction as measures of ex vivo function, even out to 30 days post cardiac arrest. Almost all of those animals have a uh, much worse uh, neurologic function afterwards. Don't really need to talk about too much about haplogroups and um, and uh, Dr. Wallace and all of his contributions to the scientific field. Thing I find very interesting, and one of the things that we're looking at is that therapeutic hypothermia. Maybe many of you uh, have heard about that therapeutic hypothermia continues to be a, a way to treat patients with cardiac arrest. The big problem is um, it doesn't really work when, in heterogeneous populations. When it's studied in Sweden or other um, European countries, it seems to work very well. And then as you sort of take these uh, therapeutic hypothermia and then spread it across uh, very heterogeneous groups or across large swaths of the world, there doesn't seem to be a, uh, a conclusive answer. So one thing we have a grant to look at is in the new, there's a very large hypothermia trial that's going on throughout Europe, Northern Africa, and Eastern Europe. And we are collecting blood samples from all of those to look at the different haplogroups of those um, patients that survive and then look at their uh, neurologic outcomes. Um, those may give us an idea of which ones are going to actually uh, do better with uh, therapeutic hypothermia uh, and which haplogroups actually should be targeted for therapeutic hypothermia. In addition, when we take murine models of, of cardiac arrest and we look at ischemic reperfusion, animals that have um, problems with decreased ATV production, animals that have problems with ROS scavenging or increased ROS, Almost all of these animals with these uh, separate My uh, Meyer Kaplan curves have much worse survival as compared to wild type animals. Even simply looking at oxidative injury after, uh, after cardiac arrest in animals that are resuscitated with 100% uh, oxygen, uh, which is the current standard of care during, to deliver during CPR, versus uh, animals uh, that are resuscitated with room air, Animals that are resuscitated with 100% oxygen have much higher um, generation of reactive oxygenation species in the brain and also exhibit much uh, higher or significantly increased oxidative injury as measured by carbonyl uh, content as well as for h &E intensity. We also looked at uh, cardiopulmonary bypass as well as ECMO, and we can look at mitochondrial signatures on patients that have been resuscitated after cardiac arrest and put on ECMO and find multiple uh, <laughs> targets and uh, problems with mitochondrial function, uh, both the brain and the heart and the kidney. Um, some of the things I wanted to just sort of end with were a couple of things that uh, we have been developing in our lab, and these are non-invasive monitors of neurometabolic uh, function as well as optical. Using optical techniques, um, we have a Frontier grant here at CHOP to look at those things. Um, but one of them is to develop a uh, real-time analysis and software that can look at real-time cerebral blood flow as well as cerebral metabolic rate, um, both all non-invasively with optical probes, 
these optical probes that we've been also working on uh, having them reflect off site of Carm C, and we actually have are working very well with some collaborations with our colleagues at the University of Cambridge uh, in England. Um, so now that we have sort of developed these different models and we've mapped the energetic response, have we really entered this era of developing mitochondrial targets? And I think that's a really critical point uh, for uh, not just mitochondrial disease, um, but for a critical illness. Um, if we have pharma and we have others, and we're starting to see a lot of smaller pharma, pharma um and academic laboratories start to really focus on mitochondrial therapeutics, I think this is what's going to really leak into helping children with mitochondrial disease. Um, and because more and more of these uh, targets are known and more and more therapeutics are being uh, designed, such as alternative biofuels, um, things that increase uh, uh, electron transport and increase ATP, such as prodrugs of succinate, or decrease um, the reverse electron transport and decrease reactive oxygenation species, such as prodrugs of malinate. Um, and so the real question is, can you start to manipulate the electron transport chain? Can you genetically uh, manipulate it? Can you manipulate uh, reactive oxygenation species generation? So I think we've really started to enter an era of, um, can you use mitochondrial drugs to alter outcome in critical illness? Um, I'm going to show a couple uh, slides um, at the end here to show that these are real, uh, real targeted drugs. I didn't really want to um, talk too much about uh, different types of drugs. However, um, these are published uh, papers that we've published looking at things that have targeted cyclophilin D, such as um, cyclosporin, um, and by giving these for five days after traumatic brain injury, we've been able to show that you can decrease the volume of injury. Additionally, um, this is, I've sort of blinded the drug that we've used, but um, we've been able to show that by using other uh, mitochondrial drugs that are targeted different aspects of the mitochondrial, uh, at mitochondrial function, that we can improve MRI and MRS, so you can improve uh, white matter injury, um, in, pay, in sorry, in large animals that have had a traumatic brain injury. In addition, um, we can uh, use these drugs and actually improve neurobehavior. So I really do believe that we're at the an era where we can start to understand uh, critical illness and mitochondria develop um, from a sort of bench to bedside approach, different types of mitochondrial therapeutics and that mitochondrial disease really is a, a uh, life switch um, between life and death um, for all sorts of, of critical illness, uh, not just for kids with mitochondrial disease or genetic mitochondrial disease, but kids that are seemingly normal that uh, have these traumatic events. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time.